Welcome to the SB Grid YouTube channel. Software tutorials by developers. Lectures by structural biologists. Unique content brought to you by SB Grid. Just, uh, this is our last uh, SB Grid webinar of 2023. So just uh, running down the schedules, kicking it off for 2024 will be Graham Winter. So uh, that's going to be Dials. Um, Graham's team lead at Diamond Light Source developed uh, Via2, among other things. So back to X rays for a change, which will be nice. Then uh, February, we've got Bjorn, Bjorn Forsberg, who worked on Rely On back in the day and now uh, has got his own project called Occupy. Uh, then in March, speaking of Rely On, we've got Shore Shares talking about Rely On 5. So that'll be March 12th. Uh, Shores from the MRC. And then April, uh, we're going to hear about RF diffusion. So that's interesting because that's um, these sort of uh, diffusion models, but for protein design. Uh, and then May is uh, free energy methods in amber. Then we've got Tomo Dragon coming up in June. Uh, and then July, uh, Match Maps, which is a, uh, a cool tool that uh, I'm uh, from Duke Hexer's lab at Harvard to uh, make difference maps from actual maps, not uh, in reciprocal space as it is typically done. That is my understanding of match maps anyway. Uh, so we'll learn more in, in July, but all right, great. Without any further uh, ado, I'll turn it over to Robin Pierce. Robin is a PhD student in the Zhang Lab at the University of Michigan Medical School. Robin, go right ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. So. Um... Today, I'm going to be talking about our work in the uh, de novo RNA tertiary structure prediction uh, using potentials from deep learning. And I guess uh, it's the, what is it, the 13th year, but maybe it's the 12th where you are. <laughs> so I'm in Singapore right now. I guess we're 13 hours ahead. So. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. That would explain the, uh, the, the, the time <laughs> difference. Yes. I was assuming you were in Ann Arbor. So it was. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for joining us in the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so just a little bit about the background. Obviously, the uh, problem here is that um, we want to uh, work on the RNA tertiary structure prediction, which is basically given an RNA sequence, we want to use some computational methods to predict the RNA 3D structure. Um, and there are a lot of motivations for this problem. So we see that experimental methods for determining RNA structure tend to be slow and expensive. And uh, we, we can see this by the fact that there are less than 500 non-redundant RNA chains with structure solved at two angstrom resolution and less than 30 with uh, lengths greater than 70 nucleotides. But we have a lot of sequence-based information. So for example, we have more than 31 million sequences in the RNA central database, which is a database of non-coding um, RNA sequences. So we can see that there's really a huge gap between the number of uh, known sequence information and the number of known RNA uh, tertiary structure information. And what we see that is that with existing RNA modeling methods, they tend to be um, less uh, accurate. So we generate models with about 20 angstrom resolution um, RMSDs to their native structures for more complex folds and um, blind RNA structure prediction experiments. Uh, so what we really want to develop is um, accurate tertiary structure modeling methods that are able to, um, given just an RNA sequence, to accurately pr uh, predict this RNA 3D structure, which is really what the um, function and the, um, the, the, the it, it's really the 3D structure is what determines the function of the RNA structure. So what we take is sort of this inter-residue distance um, view of the RNA structure. 
So you can think of the RNA structure at a 3D level, right? But this tends to be more, a little bit more difficult to predict using machine learning techniques. So what we look at is sort of this 2D view of the RNA structure. So what's, it's what's called a distance map. Um, so if you think of a distance map as the pairwise distance between each of the residues in this 3D structure, then you can see that you can clearly get um, structural motifs or patterns that are um, pretty easy to observe. So for example, this is an L by L distance map here. And what each box um, represents is basically the distance between two residues in your RNA structure. Um, so we consider a number of different distances, but um, at the basic level, we consider the distance between, for example, the, um, the N1 and the N9 atoms of your um, side chain here. And um, what basically what you can see is that uh, for this, for example, this tRNA, that there are definitely regular um, structural patterns that you can observe. And these tend to be a lot more uh, a lot more straightforward to predict in the deep learning context as opposed to the 3D structure. Um, of course, the 3D structure is possible to predict, but it tends to be a bit more unstable and uh, more difficult to predict using these uh, machine learning techniques. So what we end up predicting is a few different distances. And um, so we, if we consider this simplified view of the RNA structure, then we predict the N1 or the N9 um, distances between your bases in the RNA, the C4 prime distances, as well as the backbone phosphorus distances. And then we also have uh, what's called the orientation prediction. So here the orientation is, um, we know that, uh, that not only is the pairwise distances uh, important, but also the orientation between your different uh, nucleic acid residues. So the orientation is basically the torsion that is formed by the C4 prime and the N1 or N9 atoms from residue I and the N1 or N9 residues from uh, atom J and the C4 prime atoms from residue, uh, residue J. So this is called the omega orientation. And then we also have the lambda orientation, which is formed by the P, C4 prime, and N1 or N9 atoms from residue I, and the N1 or N9 uh, atoms from residue J. So uh, the omega um, orientation is symmetric, and then the lambda orientation here is asymmetric. Um, and then lastly, we also generate predictions for the backbone pseudo torsion angles which include the, um, the eta and theta pseudo torsion angles. So altogether, we generate predictions for um, three different distances, uh, two different orientations, which are, again are the um, torsion angles formed by the different atoms between residues, and then the um, backbone pseudo torsion angles. So we basically represent the RNA structure using these um, simplified geometric descriptions. And so then, of course, if we have the, um, the actual RNA structure, then it, it's fairly straightforward to uh, calculate these different, um, these different features. But in reality, we, of course, don't have these um, features. We actually have to be able to predict them. Um, so what we use is this uh, machine learning architecture to predict those. And it's uh, similar to what we see for that has been successful for the more advanced protein structure prediction networks, um, where essentially what we do is we start from our query RNA sequence and we search it through our sequence database. And these include the uh, NR sequence database and the RFAM sequence database. Uh, 
And what we can do is we construct a uh, multiple sequence alignment. And so what this multiple sequence alignment captures is it, it basically captures all of the uh, evolutionarily related sequences in our uh, from our sequence database that are uh, homologous to our query sequence. So this, uh, for example, this uh, multiple sequence alignment contains a lot of information where we can look at co-evolving residue patterns. So if we see that there's a mutation at position I, uh, and if there's a mutation at position I and there's a corresponding mutation at position J, then those two positions are said to co-evolve, which means that we can infer that they'd be closer together in 3D space. So that's basically the idea behind the network is to extract these different um, relationships from our multiple sequence alignments. Uh, and then, so basically in our network, we have three different representations. We have our multiple sequence alignment representation, which again captures that uh, evolutionary information in our alignment of homologous sequences. Um, we have our uh, pairwise uh, representation, which captures those pairwise distance relationships. And then we have our sequence representation, which captures the represent uh, our, our uh, initial query sequence. Um, and then what we do is that we process this using our um, self-attention mechanism. So we've seen sort of a shift in recent years from these convolutional neural networks to the uh, more self-attention based networks with methods like AlphaFold2 or um, Rosetta Fold for protein structure prediction. And basically what we tried to do is uh, apply a, a similar network for the RNA structure prediction. Um, so we have our, um, our multiple sequence alignment and I won't get too in depth into the um, different uh, self-attention mechanisms. But basically what we do is that we process this using initially the um, row self-attention, um, which maps your row to your set of uh, queries, keys, and values. And it can be used to extract your different um, evolutionary relationships. And then the um, column self-attention can be used to extract which sequences are important in your multiple sequence alignment. And we add a bias from our pair embedding to this row attention in order to ensure consistency between the um, different representations. And then we can actually use our MSA embedding then to update our pair embedding. Um, so we take the outer product mean of our MSA embedding to get an updated pair embedding. And then we can further process that using our um, self-attention mechanism. Um, using the triangle self-attention mechanism that was introduced by AlphaFold2. Um, and then lastly, what we have, we can extract our sequence embedding, which is the corresponds to that first row in our um, MSA. So if you think of this uh, MSA as an alignment of all of your homologous sequences, that first row will correspond to your original query sequence. And then we can further process that using multiple self-attention mechanisms, where the first is uh, biased by the pair embedding and the second is not. And then finally, um, from that, what we can do is we can predict our backbone pseudo-torsion angles from our sequence embedding. And then from our pair embedding, we can predict our distance maps and our orientation maps. Um, so here we generate bin predictions for our distance maps from two to 40 angstroms, and we divide this into 38 different bins. And then we have two bins um, if the distance is less than two angstroms or uh, if the distance is greater than 40 angstroms. So, and then from the orientation maps, we divide this into um, zero to 360 degrees. Uh, and then we, this is divided into 15 degree increments and we have one bin for no interaction. And similarly for the backbone torsion angles, we divide this into uh, 15 degree bins.
so I think that's probably the bulk of the deep learning method. So any specific questions on this or feel free to interrupt me. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so um, basically the output of our deep learning network then is our different um, restraints. And what we actually want, of course, is the, the 3D structure itself. Uh, so what we can use is some pretty simple optimization techniques where we take the negative log likelihood of our um, predicted potentials or our predicted probabilities and convert those into a potential. And then we can do some pretty simple LBFGS uh, optimization. So this was one of the, um, I guess, revelations from these uh, deep learning methods like TR Rosetta and other methods that have been successful in uh, the protein structure prediction space is that really uh, before what we what we had was very um, extensive conformational sampling and uh, Monte Carlo simulations. But if we have enough um, deep learning restraints that are accurately predicted, then really we can use these uh, pretty simple and uh, rapid local optimization techniques like LBFGS, um, or even the end-to-end -end, uh, learning. So we take our distance maps and our orientation maps and our torsion angles, and we take the predicted probabilities and we calculate the negative log likelihood of these probabilities, and we convert those into potentials for each of our different restraints. And then we do some pretty simple gradient-based optimization to actually produce a uh, final model here. So this is just a, an example from about a, a 100 nucleotide RNA. So we can fold uh, a 100 nucle uh, nucleotide RNA in about one minute. Um, and we can see that the uh, initial part of the simulation is essentially the, the global fold is decided very quickly. And then towards the end of it, we have these very uh, minor optimizations of the uh, overall structure. But it, it, it's one of the nice things about the LBFGS is that it's it's very fast. Of course, that can be a bit of a downside if you get trapped in some sort of local minimum. Um, but overall, if we're able to uh, predict these restraints fairly accurately, then, then the uh, global structure should be accurate as well. And we should be able to produce these um, structures fairly uh, rapidly. Okay, so now I'll talk more about the overall results. Um, so we applied this pipeline to model across the different RFAM families. So the RFAM uh, database is a uh, database of the um, different RNA families, and they have diverse structures. So we wanted to test uh, to see if this method would be accurate across uh, different RFAM families. And what we see is that across these 32 experimentally resolved RFAM families that we're able to generate accurate folds. So of course we have very well characterized RFAM families like the tRNA, um, and then we have uh, less well characterized RFAM families. So what we see is that, it, that the success of the modeling accuracy isn't localized to um, any, any single family here, which is I think uh, pretty encouraging. Um, and then we also uh, calculated the results on the RNA puzzles, uh, RNA puzzles data set. So here, RNA puzzles is essentially a data set of the um, more difficult RNA uh, modeling targets. And uh, initially, this is a, a blind challenge. So the, the uh, assessors will release an RNA sequence and then everybody will model the sequence without knowledge of the structure. Um, and then they'll publish their structures um, that they predict. Uh, so here, this is sort of a retrospective test on this data set. 
And many of the RFAM, um, the RNA puzzles uh, predictors, they use restraints from experiments like uh, shape data or different um, chemical probing um, data. And here we just do it completely de novo without the use of any experimental restraints. And what we can see is that across a number of the different targets where our, um, we have the results shown in ter uh, terms of the TM score, which uh, takes a value from zero to one and a TM score of one means that essentially your prediction is perfect and greater than 0 0.45 means that you have a correct fold um, between your predicted structure and the native structure. What we can see is that for many of these targets, we're able to um, produce substantially more accurate models, um, which is, I think, uh, pretty encouraging. So we can see that, for example, um, for targets five, six, and seven, there's a, a pretty big gap between the um, our model and the next best model that was submitted by the uh, community. Uh, in, in terms of the RMSD here, we can see that for many of the targets, we're able to model them with RMSDs about uh, less than four angstroms or so. I think our average RMSD on this data set was about um, 2.2 angstroms um, compared to, I think the next best uh, average RMSD from the predictors was about uh, four and a half angstroms or so. So it's it's a, a fairly encouraging result on this data set. And then, um, so of course the, the question here is whether or not we can actually model these low homology, newly released RNA structures. So if we're uh, able to train our method and have a successful method, then it should be able to generalize on RNA sequences that are very uh, dissimilar to what they were trained on. Um, so this is what this low homology means. It means uh, essentially that these sequences are completely different from the sequences that the method was trained on. So what we did was that we curated a set of 96 RNA structures that were uh, released after we collected our training data set, and they had lengths between 30 to uh, 300 nucleotides. And we eliminated all of those um, structures and sequences with homology to any previously solved RNAs. So here we did it based on the uh, BLAST E value. So we took a uh, BLAST E value less than uh, 1.0. And unfortunately, we only had about seven structures that remain since uh, we have uh, very few RNA structures that have been solved in the uh, PDB database. And three of these possess novel folds. So novel folds here means that um, there are uh, no uh, analogs or structural analogs in the PDB before these um, RNA were solved and they're marked by the axis. Uh, and then we compared our RMSD to the um, SIM RNA program, which has been uh, very successful for the RNA structure modeling. And what we can see is that uh, indeed we are able to um, model these low homology RNA structures uh, pretty successfully. So our average RMSD was about uh, 2.36 angstroms, and the average RMSD of SIMRNA here was about um, 10.35 uh, angstroms. And we're, we were able to model these um, novel folds fairly successfully, which was uh, also pretty encouraging. So now I'll go through uh, a, a few examples from some of these uh, novel folds that our network was not trained on, that it uh, saw essentially for the first time. Um, so the first example here is from the dengue virus RNA promoter. And um, we can see at the top is the sim RNA model in red and the native structure in yellow. And then at the bottom here is the default RNA model in uh, blue and the native structure in yellow. 
Um, so we were able to model this um, structure with about uh, a 3.7 angstrom arm SD, which was again under that four angstrom cutoff uh, compared to a 16.7 angstrom arm SD for the SIM RNA model. And the interesting thing about, uh, thing about this model is that the multiple sequence alignment for this particular structure only had um, uh, really two different sequences. So we would call this a very, a very shallow uh, multiple sequence alignment, meaning the evolutionary information for this particular target is uh, is 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 pretty is is lacking essentially. So the overall net value, which is the number of effective sequences, was just zero point three two. Um, so that is uh, is is pretty low for the RNA structure prediction or for the um, protein structure prediction. So the fact that we were able to generate an accurate model for both a um, a fold that was unseen and for a uh, target with very few homologous sequences is uh, particularly promising. And the other interesting thing to note about this uh, particular target is that it was solved using um, NMR. And we can see from the um, NMR ensemble here that there's a bit of um, flexibility in the overall global structure. Um, so if you look at all of the different um, NMR ensembles here, that uh, actually our, our structure fits pretty nicely in this um, experimental ensemble. And the, they, the authors here solved the SACS envelope as sort of a, a secondary validation of the uh, RNA tertiary structure. Uh, after they solved the NMR ensemble. And you can see that in this um, SACS envelope that this top part of the structure protrudes from this envelope. And in our uh, predicted structure, we see that this uh, top part of the structure is sort of more tucked into um, to the to the structure. So it's, it's just a, another interesting uh, note that maybe we're uh, fairly in line with the experimental characterization for, for this uh, particular RNA. Um, and then the, the last one I'll talk about is the uh, N uh, NPSL2 regulatory element from the Oncomir-1 RNA. Um, so again, on the left-hand side, we have our predicted structure from default RNA, which is shown in blue, and the native structure here is shown in yellow. And then on the right-hand side, we have the um, structure that was predicted by SimRNA shown in red. And we have the native structure that was, is shown in yellow. And again, we're able to um, model this structure with less than four angstrom RMSD, um, which is uh, notable because, uh, as I mentioned before, this is a novel structure that the method wasn't trained on either at the sequence level or at the structure level. So this is just uh, showing that we're able to generalize to these um, unseen RNA. And the other thing to note about this particular structure is that um, in the uh, manuscript that the authors wrote, they say that in the um, NPSL2 structure that the A20 and C29 um, bases have the potential to form an AC mismatch in this apical loop. And the AC mismatches tend to be stabilized at low pH uh, when the A uh, nitrogen one atom is protonated and can form this um, AC mis, uh, mispair. Um, so in the, I think in the, in the native structure, you have this AC pair is um, fairly uh, farther apart. But apparently that the authors note that these are able to form this um, mispair at lower pHs. So what we see is that in the, actually in the predicted structure that A20 and C29 um, are fairly close together, almost forming um, this base pair, which uh, maybe is um, 
indicates that they're able to capture some sort of alternative structures in the uh, predicted um, predicted RNA structure of this particular uh, regulatory element, which is, uh, I think it's fairly interesting since this structure only appears at lower uh, pHs. Okay, so I think that's all for the first part. Um, any any questions? I, I, I can cover the next part fairly uh, briefly. Any if, questions? Uh, Feel free to put them in the QA if you've got them. I can uh, stop uh, run along the way, or we can um, save time for questions at the end and come back. That's also fine. Yeah, yeah. Feel free to interrupt right. me or whatever is best. <laughs> All right. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I'll I'll just go ahead then. So basically, the the uh, limitations for the RNA structure prediction is on the. Um, limited experimental um, experimentally solved structures. So we only have a few thousand PDB structures for RNA. Um, but as I mentioned before, what we have is we have millions of RNA sequences. Uh, and we can see that uh, what we want to do is, uh, is there a way that we can basically leverage all of this sequence data that we do have to predict um, our RNA structures. And one of the uh, pretty promising methods that has emerged in recent years is the use of these um, language models for um, augmenting our predictions. So we see this with uh, methods like ESM Fold for um, protein structure prediction, where we're able to, um, the authors there were able to train these very large pre-trained language models and then apply them downstream to the protein structure prediction. Um, so what we want to do is uh, essentially come up with um, similar language models for the RNA uh, structure prediction. So can we train these very large RNA sequence models and then use that information that's learned in an unsupervised manner to guide our RNA 3D structure prediction? Um, so the RNA sequence model here, it's um, fairly simple. So it's it's uh, essentially similar to the uh, BERT models for the um, natural language processing, where the goal is that we take our query RNA sequence and we mask some regions of our inputs. And then the network tries to predict the nucleotides in those mass regions. And then, of course, we um, map that to our set of queries, keys, and values. And um, the interesting thing that has emerged in the um, protein structure prediction and the RNA structure prediction is that we see that from these attention matrices, actually, we can essentially um, extract these distance-based or these contact um, relationships here. So what we did was that we took these attention matrices from, we, we pre-trained our language model on the RNA central database. Um, and we had a, a two different language models with either 710 million parameters or 1.1 billion parameters. And then we took these um, 2D attention matrices and then just had a very simple linear regression model to try to predict our um, contact and distance maps to see if we could extract those relationships in an unsupervised manner. So essentially the pre-training is all done on the sequence level. And then we do some very um, simple fine tuning with um, basically a, a, a fairly trivial network on the um, structure level. And what we can see is that actually, if we look at the contact precision um, of the top um, L over five, where L is the protein length, so this is the number of selected contacts based on the predicted uh, contact probability, that actually the precision is, um, it's, it's less than default RNA, but it's still um, fairly high. So of course, deepfold RNA was trained on this task in particular, 
But the language models here were trained in essentially an unsupervised manner. So they weren't trained specifically on the task of um, recapitulating these contact or distance maps. So it's um, particularly um, encouraging that that uh, they are able to capture this structural information, even though the pre-training was all done at the sequence level, and then just some very simple fine tuning at the structure level. So it should indicate that we're able to uh, use these to uh, capture some of the structure relationships. Um, and so in our most recent pipeline, actually what we did was essentially similar to the default RNA um, pipeline, except instead of taking the multiple sequence alignments and our 2D representation from our um, predicted secondary structure or our uh, paired sequence information, what we can do is we can take actually the hidden states from our language model or the sequence embeddings from our language model as our MSA representation and we can take our attention matrices as our 2D representation here in our network. Um, and we can process this information using a very similar network uh, to what we did for our MSA and our, um, our uh, predicted secondary structure originally in deepfold RNA, where we take our sequence embedding and we process that using our row attention to extract these um, coevolutionary relationships. And then we uh, process that using our column attention, and then we can update our pair embedding using the outer product mean of our sequence embedding here, and then further process that using our triangular self-attention to generate our predictions for the distance maps and our um, orientation maps. So uh, basically what we can do is that uh, we're, we're trying to incorporate these um, these very large pre-trained language models to predict our RNA structure um, directly. And then um, based on our predicted distance maps and our predicted orientation maps, we can take our negative log likelihood of these to generate our potential. And then um, again, we can use some pretty um, rapid and simple um, gradient-based LBFGS minimization to produce uh, a predicted final model. Um, so I'll just uh, go over comparison uh, on the CASP targets. So these are the results on the um, CASP-15 experiments. Um, so here CASP is basically like, it, it's traditionally been the benchmark in the protein structure prediction space, but recently they added a, um, a, a category for the RNA structure prediction. So again, this is sort of a blind test of your um, the accuracy of your RNA structure prediction method. Um, and this is retrospective. So we developed this following the um, CAS15 experiment. And what we saw that in the CAS15 experiment, that the RNA structure, these deep learning um, RNA structure prediction methods were fairly successful at modeling the natural RNA targets. Um, but there were also a few um, on synthetic targets um, or aptomeric targets in the CASP experiments that were very difficult for the traditional or, or very difficult for the deep learning based methods to model. Um, and so what we see actually with the, the deep learning methods is that we're able to model these synthetic targets um, fairly accurately, which is encouraging. So um, I'll just show a few examples fairly quickly from the CASP experiment. So this is the top method, um, which was more of a traditional physics-based RNA folding approach in the CASP um, experiment. And this is our default um, RNA model. Uh, oh, sorry, actually this should be, uh, the RMSD here is incorrect. It should be about 23 angstroms. Um, so I, actually on this uh, target, we were able to generate the uh, most accurate um, RNA structure model. 
for R1116. Um, and then for um, R1117, we are fairly close to the top um, CAS15 method. So our RMSD is about um, 2.1 angstroms compared to about 1.5 angstroms for the, the uh, top method in CAS15. Um, but the, the interesting thing here is that I think the, the best deep learning method when we had originally submitted it for these targets, for example, R1128, which is a synthetic um, six-way junction RNA, our RMSD was originally about 40 angstroms or so. Um, so we can see that uh, with the inclusion of these language models, um, using this very large pre-trained database, we're able to improve our RMSD from about 40 angstroms to within a few angstroms of the um, top method in uh, CAS15. So this is very uh, encouraging for us that uh, it is, uh, this type of method is working. Um, and then similarly, uh, similarly for R1126, which is a synthetic, um, another synthetic RNA, I think originally our RMSD was about um, 40 or, or 50 angstroms from the original deep fold RNA pipeline. And again, we're able to improve it to about 11.9 um, angstroms. So it's still a little bit worse overall than the, the uh, top physics-based method, but it, it is significantly um, better than our original submission on these targets. Uh, and then lastly, for R1136, which is the final um, synthetic RNA here, uh, which is uh, from the, uh, it's an aptifret, an aptameric uh, RNA, that is fairly large, we're able to generate a prediction that is about 9.95 angstroms. So I think uh, originally on this model, our RMSD was about uh, 20 or so angstroms, or, or sorry, 40 or so angstroms. So we were, again, able with the inclusion of these pre-trained language models to um, significantly improve our overall uh, model accuracy. Um, yeah, so for the future direction, what we hope to do is we hope to extend our modeling to the protein RNA and the RNA-RNA interactions, and then to develop also the language models for the protein RNA and the RNA-RNA interactions, and then to apply these different models to the wide-scale modeling of the unknown RFAM families for RNA. Um, and then there are also some interesting applications for the design of therapeutic RNA molecules where we can do some um, pretty interesting things like uh, backpropagating the gradients through our network um, to actually design uh, new RNA molecules. Uh, so that's all I have. If anybody has any questions. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Robin. Questions for Robin, you can raise your hand with the reactions button. There's a raise hand. You can um, put your questions into the Q&A so that, uh, and they will get, uh, sorry, my Q&A window is here somewhere. There it is. And questions will show up and we can bump them up to the top. I've got a couple, so I can uh, stir them up. So just on this last round, when you're talking about these synthetic RNAs, um, mm -hmm. do you think that the, the sort of lack of accuracy there stems from, I mean, if these are, purely synthetic, presumably there's no co-evolution co information in the MSAs to draw large scale contacts. Like you, is, right. do you think that that's what's really like influencing this or lack of accuracy without the large language model component? Yeah, absolutely. So what we see that um, for proteins and for RNA, if we, if the MSAs have no um, homologous sequences or no evolutionary history, then the accuracy tends to be a lot less. And then, uh, of course, for these um, synthetic aptameric RNAs, um, we don't have really any evolutionary history. So our multiple sequence alignments are basically empty. Um, so the, the accuracy is definitely a lot lower for those, those targets where we can't really learn from our 
um, evolutionary history, we have to uh, sort of apply these large language models instead. So that was one of my questions that I had. But the performance with the uh, language models, is it, um, what is it like relative to say your, your sort of the approach you presented earlier in the talk? Like, is it, for proteins, it's faster, I think. Uh, yeah. I've seen, but uh, how's that play out for RNA? Yeah, for actually for the RNA, the um, so for proteins, what we see is that it it, it tends to be faster but less accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the RNA, it tends to be faster and similarly accurate. <laughs> so uh, it it seems like the um, for the RNA that uh, a lot of the methods are like single sequence based um, as opposed to MSA based, which may be because the evolutionary profiles are a little more explicit for the RNA. The exact base pairing patterns may be um, a little less buried in these deep multiple sequence alignments and a little more obvious at the sequence level itself. Um, so for the language models, it, it, it seems to be about uh, roughly on par with the MSA-based uh, methods. Which is, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, which is a sort of a, a departure from the protein structure prediction case. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, how big can you go? Like uh, those, those ones you showed toward the end there, those synthetics, those are pretty large. Like, what sort of the largest sort of practical length of nucleotides can you do? And are are you doing multimers or are you just single single strands? Yeah, so so far we're we're doing single strands. Um, of course, uh, we are right now working on extending for the multimers. I think the largest, at least uh, in the the cast, was about um, seven hundred and twenty nucleotides. Um, but I, I think that's probably uh, about seven hundred to a thousand that we're able to model fairly consistently. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's probably beyond that. Uh, the accuracy would start to uh, decrease depending on the target. But you're you're still in sort of comfortable amounts of RAM on your GPU, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, that's that's encouraging. Do you have any intentions of doing sort of a, a large scale, like let's just model a bunch of RNAs and build a big database sort of thing, you know, uh, I know that's been done for proteins and, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think that, um, I think there's certainly an opportunity, especially with, uh, as I mentioned, the RCAM families to sort of model those with unknown structures. The, the interesting thing about the RNA or the, the challenging thing about RNA is it tends to be a lot more flexible than the proteins. So we see that um, we can have structures that have very uh, uh, large unstructured regions or unpaired regions. And then maybe only a certain part of the structure has a, a paired region or a structured region, which is, I, I guess, a bit more challenging for the RNA. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, hopefully we can certainly apply this to some sort of large scale um, database. Yeah, when you showed that sort of non canonical interaction, which you may end up seeing more and more as you like sort of model these out, you'd need at least some data points that show that when we see these things, they they do map to actual real structures at some level, and right. uh, it could indicate interesting RNA structures that people would go after experimentally that they might not otherwise target because. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Kind of like interesting interactions people haven't seen. Pete has his hand up, go ahead. Yep, uh, great, <clears throat> sorry, great talk. Robin, I had two questions, one of which you were kind of hinting about with the, the increased flexibility of the RNAs in general. Have you guys thought about possibly like predicting a distribution of structures and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the idea being maybe it doesn't have something static, but if you're in the right ballpark, you might have somewhere close. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a, a very good question. So I, we had, um, 
actually a collaborator that was working on uh, sort of the prediction of the RNA uh, dynamics, if they could get some sort of picture of different or alternative confirmations for the RNA. Um, one of the things that we did to try to capture that is by taking different restraint ensembles. Um, so basically what you can do is you can, um, you can use different trained models and each model will give you a different distance map. And then you can sort of ensemble those distance map to capture maybe some sort of um, alternative confirmations or um, uh, look at alternative structures. But uh, that's certainly an area that we would have to uh, explore further. I think it's very worthwhile though. It, it seems like these kinds of things always, there's always interesting areas to explore. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and I the the second question I had is maybe I apologize if this is something you covered, but for the the final the final minimization step, like intuitively, is that minimizing error coming out of the networks? Is that a pseudo physical potential or does that not really have anything that would correspond with previous intuitions? Uh so for this uh minimization? Yep. Yeah, so uh, the minimization here is just um, the the structure based um, minimization. Basically, the goal of it is to take these two D distance maps and to fold the um, RNA in um, the three D space. So what we do is we try to minimize the structure. Um, in relation to the distance map to actually get our final predicted model. So we're not really altering the predicted um, distance maps or the predictions from our network. We're just trying to generate a 3D structure from our, our 2D output of our network. Okay. If that, yeah, if that makes sense. Oh, I, I'm going to possibly make a bad analogy here, but that's feels like it might be roughly analogous to an NMR experiment where you have distance constraints and you want a 3D structure. Yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah, we have distance constraints here and we want a, a 3D structure from our final model. Okay, great, thank you. Great, well, uh, we've got time for one more and I'll, I'll take it, came in from the Q&A. Uh, sort of a bigger question, um, you know, RNA structures, Divalent metals are, you know, huge determinant of RNA structure. They're critical for folding. And uh, what are you thinking around the idea of, you know, modeling in these ions, these uh, divalents, you know, cations that are required for folding? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Um, so we have things like the uh, people who are very interested in the ions as well as uh, even small molecules for therapeutic development and other other considerations like that. So it's, um, I think it's a little bit more difficult. Um, so currently our input is just the RNA sequence and we don't consider any of like the ions or the environmental factors. Um, we, we have done a little work on that for the protein structure prediction. Um, but typically we, we basically run the modeling and then we try to predict, uh, potential ion bonding sites. So I, I haven't really, I, I'm not sure that I, I personally have considered that problem too much. Um, but I, I certainly think it's, it's worthwhile. I don't, I don't think that's a very, uh, it's probably not a, a satisfying answer. Uh, well, I'm I not. Just I don't even I have to admit that I know, you know, those are those things are critical, obviously, but I don't I have no idea how well represented they are in the yeah of the protein data bank, right? Like that. I mean, the RNA structures would have to be of high enough resolution that you'd be able to actually identify them in a way that uh, you're confident about. I know experimentally it's easy to do for things like catalytic RNAs and stuff like that, but uh, right. it's interesting. So, all right. Well, great. Well, with that. We can wrap it up. Robin, thank you very much for a fascinating and interesting talk. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Last talk of 2023. So uh, that'll be uh, happy holidays and uh, 
Happy New Year to everybody, and we will connect in 2024, as weird as that is to Sam. Uh, and um, yeah, see you then. Thank you.